Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to National Action Network Saturday Action Rally. We're coming to you live on WLIB, 1190 AM in New York. We're streaming to you all across the country, including Facebook and nationalactionnetwork.net. We are live right here in the House of Justice, 106 West 145th Street. Call somebody. Tell them the action is on the air. The Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton is in the house and getting ready to come to you. We're so pleased that you are with us on this Saturday morning because if it's Saturday and you hear the cry of no justice, no peace, you know this is where the action is. Our president and founder is the Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton. Chairman of our board is the Reverend Dr. W. Franklin Richardson, senior pastor of Grace Baptist Church in Mount Vernon, New York. I'm attorney Michael Hardy, and we'll be with you throughout the broadcast this morning. We are so pleased to have with us this week, weekend for our inspirational word segment, the Reverend Thurcell C. Williams, executive pastor of New Hope Baptist Church of East Orange, New Jersey. Of course, if it's Saturday, our musical director is in the house, Minister Tyrone Richardson, and if it's Saturday, our dear sister, Darlene, uh, Nancy, uh, I'm sorry, hold on. Uh, Nancy Darlene Crawford will be here to ask you what's on your mind. And she wants to know what's on your mind because there's so much happening across the world that something must be on your mind that you're thinking about and that you can share with Sister Crawford. If you've not had an opportunity to do so, you can still do so. You can call 877-626-4651 or you can email what's on your mind at nationalactionnetwork.net. Also, the Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton is in the house. So you want to call somebody, you want to tell them the action is on the air. The Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton is in the house and getting ready to come to you. Brothers and sisters, we always want to remind you that uh, the Saturday, um, that the NAN Youth Huddle will meet on Monday, March 11th at the House of Justice Auditorium. So please spread the word and get into the action with our youngest and brightest dreamers of today and leaders of tomorrow. For more information on the Youth Huddle experience, you can call us at 877-626-4651 or email nanyouthhuddle at gmail.com. Today, 5 p.m. Tomorrow, 5 p.m. That's today, Saturday, 5 p.m. Tomorrow, Sunday, 5 p.m. You want to make sure that you are tuning in to MSNBC's Politics Nation with Al Sharpton. That's today, Saturday at 5 p.m. Tomorrow, Sunday at 5 p.m. You want to make sure that you are tuning in to Politics Nation on MSNBC. See, right now, brothers and sisters, Dr. Alvin Ponder is going to come. He's the vice president of the New York City chapter, and he's going to bring you some additional information. Give him a welcome. Thank you, Attorney Hardy. Good morning, brothers and sisters, listeners and viewers, and thank you for tuning in to another Saturday Action Rally with the National Action Network. Here's some information to keep you in the know. Bloody Sunday, on Sunday, Reverend Sharpton was in Selma, Alabama to, to commemorate 
the 59th anniversary of Bloody Sunday, when civil rights leaders like John Lewis and countless others were tear gassed and beaten as they marched for the right to vote. Vice President Kamala Harris spoke at the foot of the Edmund Pettus Bridge and walked alongside Reverend Sharpton as they and hundreds others marched over the bridge this past Sunday. Reverend Sharpton pushed a wheelchair, carrying one of the original foot soldiers from that bloody Sunday 59 years ago, and was surrounded by the vice president on one side and attorney Ben Crump on the other. Clergy, activists, elected officials, and people from all around the country came to Selma on Sunday to remember the sacrifices of the past and the importance of preserving our rights. Reverend Sharpton broadcasted his MSNBC show, Politics Nation, live from Selma on Sunday and featured interviews with notable guests such as U.S. Assistant Attorney General Kristen Clark. National Action Network continuously fights to preserve our right to vote and pushes back against draconian tactics aimed at voter suppression. Reverend Sharpton, whose mother was from Alabama, reminded everyone that it was the exposure of the brutality of Bloody Sunday and what was transpiring in Alabama that drove the momentum for the Voting Rights Act to eventually become law. He said that the battles of the past paved the way so that a black woman vice president could walk across the bridge today. And it is up to us to continue the good fight to preserve our right to vote. <laughs> Health equity in transplantation. Reverend Sharpton and RB legend Al B. Shure have teamed up to demand equity and fairness in transplantation, they are calling on the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to restore Medicare coverage for critical blood tests that detects early signs of organ rejection. You missed that. They want to restore Medicare coverage for critical blood tests that would detect when the organ is, has been rejected. Now, the coverage was rolled back one year ago by a private contractor, and those most impacted by the rollback of these life-saving blood tests are disproportionately black, Latino, and other underserved communities. Al B. Sure, who was gravely ill and in a coma, received a life-saving liver transplant and has since become a fierce advocate for fairness in the healthcare system, he and Reverend Sharpton formed the Health Equity in Transplantation Coalition last year, where he serves as the executive chairman and Reverend Sharpton serves as the senior advisor. One year after a private contractor rolled back that uh, coverage, Reverend Sharpton and Al B. Sure are still calling on government agencies to reinstate those vital services. Protesting for DEI, Reverend Sharpton, National Action Network and supporters continue their ongoing protests on Thursday outside of Bill Ackman's Manhattan office for what is now the 10th week in a row. The weekly demonstration against Ackman's attacks on diversity, equity, and inclusion programs has garnered attention from a broad spectrum of individuals and groups who stand in solidarity with NAN as we fight to preserve DEI. The hedge fund billionaire Ackman orchestrated a vicious smear campaign against former Harvard president, Dr. Claudine Gay last year, you remember, and targeted DEI each and every Thursday. Protesters from all backgrounds joined NAN as they chant in unison, when DEI is under attack, what do we do? Yeah. And what, what do we want? Yeah. And when do we want it? Yeah. Woo! <laughs> eulogy, eulogy, for, eulogy for Ramon McGee. On Tuesday, Reverend Sharpton was in Memphis, Tennessee to deliver the eulogy for Ramon McGee, who died while in custody of Shelby County, 
of the Shelby, in custody at the Shelby County Jail. Also in custody were Gershon Freeman, Dion Byrd, and Marcus Donald. Now, McGee was found unresponsive on January 10th and was taken to the hospital where he died on January 12th. Now, according to a preliminary autopsy, he suffered, listen, from extensive body insect infestations, kidney disease, severe anemia, and organ failure and sepsis. Photos released with the report show extremely unsanitary conditions in the jail, and the family says McGee was covered with lice and bed bugs. Reverend Sharpton and attorney Ben Crump held a press conference prior to the memorial service where they demanded justice for the family. Reverend Sharpton shared how every time he's in Memphis, he goes by the Lorraine Motel to remind himself of Dr. King's sacrifice so that we could continue to stand up today and fight. He asked how they could allow a young man to be infested with bed bugs and lice in a town where Dr. King gave his life. He called on immediate accountability for every guard, correctional officer, and anyone who was involved in the neglect and abuse of this man. The 2024 NAN Convention in just one month Reverend Sharpton and the National Action Network have convened their 2024 National Convention. People from every corner of the country and from overseas will gather for NAN's annual conference taking place at the Sheraton New York Times Square Hotel from April 10th through 13th. Just as in years past, the convention will bring together thousands to tackle the greatest civil rights issues of our time. Each year, NAN hosts elected officials, celebrities, activists, thinkers, youth leaders, and many others for several days as we renew our spirits and strategize for the year ahead. NAN 2024 will once again serve as an opportunity to hear from those striving for change, discuss our current challenges, and map out ways to keep progressing forward. NAN's convention features panels, plenary sessions, a women's empowerment luncheon, an awards dinner, a minister's luncheon, and so much more. Everyone from the President of the United States and the Vice President to congressional leaders and Senate representatives to New York City and state elected officials and many others from across the political spectrum have addressed the convention. Last year, Vice President Kamala Harris delivered the keynote address. This year, an election year will be another history maker. Details about the annual convention, including speakers and a breakdown of the program, will be updated on our website at www.nationalactionnetwork.net. And you be sure now to check back regularly for more information on NAN's 2024 convention and register today. It's free. It's free. Welcome to all of you who have turned in and joined us also via live stream at www.nationalactionnetwork.net and also live at, on Facebook at The National Action Network. If this is your first time joining us and or if you're not a member of NAN, we welcome you to NAN and invite you to join us and get into the action today for more information and for more and, and to join, you may visit again that website is www.nationalactionnetwork.net or you can call 877-626-4651. Again, that number is 877-626-4651, or just text the word NAN, N-A-N, to 59769. Welcome. All right. Thank you, Dr. Ponda. Right now, brothers and sisters, our dear sister, Nancy Darlene Crawford, wants to know what's on your my good, good morning. morning. Good morning. Good morning, National Action, National Action Network family and friends. Welcome to another weekly segment of What's on Your Mind, where you, the community base and membership, share with us your viewpoints of what is on your mind. Now, we have a little line here today, so we're going to ask everyone to please come forward and briefly share one thought of what's on your mind. 
what's on my mind is DEI. And we always pick it and chant. And when we pick it and chant, we say we're going to shut it down. So my suggestion is that we get at least 3,000 people and we come out there and we shut 11th Avenue down so no traffic can go through for the time that we are out there. So this way, we, our statement will be heard and recognized, okay? Because a lot of times we, we protest every week. It's the 10th week and nothing is done. It might be recognized, but let us go out there and make a statement because it's enough of us to get together with the radio programs and all of us together and we could say something and do something and make a statement that they respond and listen to us. Thank you so much, my brother. And, and let's be reminded, we are making a statement. Yes, we, are. we are making a statement. All right. Good morning, my sister. Share your name and briefly share one thought of what's on your mind. Good day, everybody, and God bless everybody. My name is Sister Reverend Word. I'm from Heaven, born in Harlem. I'm 72 years old and new, and I'm a National Action Network Lifetime member. Of course, what's on my mind is Bible scriptures. In particular, Christ Jesus really made every effort to select women to be part of the Christian ministry. That reminds me of President Biden's State of the Union address, and to see this woman, Vice President, stand behind him and support him. And I know some of what he said was due to the advice that he received from women on his administration. So there's a lot of good women who want good things to happen for good women, but there's also some women who don't want good things to happen for women, but we outnumber them. We're women who want good for women, we outnumber them, and we will vote and get democracy going. All right, all right. All right. Thank you, my sister. Good morning. Your name, briefly share one thought of what's on your mind. Good, good, good morning. And um, I'm Minister Sandra. Um, what's on my mind is I look at the news and I see how they are putting the National Guards and the military. They need to be on the train. That's where the attacks are. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, my sister. Good morning. Your name and briefly share one thought of what's on your mind. Bless the Lord. This is Chaplain Sandra Mitchell, born in, the, in Harlem, and, in the, and now I'm in the Bronx. All right, sis. What's on your mind? What we're doing in the Bronx and what we're doing in all five boroughs and across the state. We joined the Right to Council on March 13th. That's next week in Albany. We're in Albany every week about housing. Okay, people are getting evicted. They don't know their rights. We are teaching them their rights. We are giving... We're giving, um, um, giving them information that they don't have to be alone. They can get a free counsel, or if they don't have counsel, they can get an adjournment until they can get counsel. We're going up to Albany March 13th to demand civil legal services, $260 million for RTC. We talk money. We ain't got time to be wailing and crying or whatever like that. Show us the money. You said right to counsel is, is, is on the books, so now we need to see the money that's on the books. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Good morning, my brother. Your name and briefly share one thought of what's on your mind. Hi, my name is Tony Veer. I'm originally from the Boogie Down. Uh, DJ Cool Herc, if you see me, what's up, yo? So today's concept, what I have, what's on my mind is artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is awesome. I use ChatGPT, I use InVideo, but I found out there's another type of artificial intelligence, cognitive dissonance. There's a saying, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still because he doesn't know he's believing in his artificial intelligence. That means that he don't want to learn. He's dumb and don't know it. So that's what we're dealing with in politics, with MAGA, with racism, and everything. So if we can outthink them, they'll be standing around saying, oh, gee, um, what should I do next? Because nobody's brilliant, but if you don't want to learn something new every day, you're asking for trouble. All right. Thank you so much for sharing. Good morning, your name, and briefly share one thought of what's on your mind. Good morning, Nan. I'm Dr. Jesse Fields, medical doctor in the Harlem community. What's on my mind is that yesterday was International Women's Day and yeah. continuing, continuing, we're continuing to honor Black History Now 
and during Women's History Month and forward, let us recognize the international nature of a people born of Africa, brought to the Americas and to the Caribbean and elsewhere by force, but fighting enslavement, fighting for full emancipation, resi resisting and rising still, today with a task to transform a whole world, bearing the pain and the hope, the beauty and the promise of the world. No justice, no peace. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fields. Good morning, my sister. Your name and briefly share one thought of what's on your mind. Good morning. I'm Winifred Ayuk from Brooklyn, New York. Yeah. What's on my mind is in response to what Reverend R. Sharpton said last week, wanting to see more attention on African conflicts like in the Middle East, Ukraine, and Russia now. We Africans, we don't ever stay focused on our own issues. We always go where the cameras are and where people are. You can't believe our leaders had already gone to President Putin, pleading with him to stop the war in Russia, whereas we don't hear their voices in Africa. Ongoing conflict in Cameroon, more than 6,000 people have died in the English part with confrontation with government forces. No voices from them yet. Even three months before Mr. Annan died, Kofi Annan, he was asked on BBC, why Syria, Syria, instead of Democratic Republic of Congo? You with your position and your voice, why not focus on that and pull attention? Also look at the big voice South Africa has put on the Middle East issue by suing Israel. We don't hear their voice like that on African conflict. Ghanaians in London also raise funds for Ukraine. They don't do that on African conflict. We need you people to come and help us to turn inwardly on Africa. This is why I say we continue to lose the continent. All right. Thank you, my sister. Thank you so much for sharing. And that concludes this week's segment of What's on Your Mind. We want to remind you that everything you heard here today are simply the viewpoints of the contributors and do not reflect those of National Action Network. Thank you so much for tuning in. Back to you, Attorney Harding. Thank you, Nancy. Right now, brothers and sisters, our Nan Change Choir soloist, Tisha Hunt. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the month of March, and our Women's uh, Auxiliary does a special segment each month, and it's our honor and privilege right now to bring our dear sister, Jamie Bland, who heads up our Patterson, New Jersey, NAN chapter, to bring our special guest for today. Let's give her a welcome. 
Greetings, National Action Network, and good morning. The women, of, the women of NAN are in the house, on the move, connecting, supporting, uplifting the movement and our cause, and activating women on the ground to be engaged and involved in the change we wish to see. The Women of Auxiliary of National Action Network of New York City Chapter is an active component of the nation's leading civil rights organization under the leadership of Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton. We organize to energize women in the city uh, to show up, be involved, and have a voice. We support the chapter and leadership in ways that work to sustain the network and grounds and we, we work to connect and empower the next generation for success. We do these things through various activities and initiatives that are bolstered through the organization. Whether it's giving away our annual holiday baskets to families in need during the holiday season, having forums for life for the community that addre to address our concerns around health care, family preservation, mental health, and financial empowerment, honoring community leaders at our 26th Annual Women of Excellence Men of Vision Awards, which will be held at the National Action Network 106 West, 100, West 145th Street in the village of Harlem on March 30th, 2024 from 2 to 7 p.m. For tickets, you can see our auxiliary President Lisa Goldie Harps. We also give our youth scholarships from colleges, from college through Kathy Jordan Sharpton Scholarship Fund. The Women's Auxiliary of NAN are committed and work daily to empower communities and nurture the next generation for success. Today, the Women's Auxiliary will be hosting a Health Awareness Forum at the House of Justice location at 106 West 145th Street in the Village of Harlem. Today, Health Forum will be held at 12 till 2 p.m. We invite you to join and support the Women Auxiliary and help lift our women up. Women who have been the movement pillars for many generations. We meet every first Saturday of the month, immediately following the Saturday Action Rally. For more information on how to join us, please call 877-626-4651. Today, the Women's Auxiliary is wearing shades of burgundy, often symbolizes individuality, intensity, ambition, power and sophistication. Our guest speaker today has all that, Judge Cameron Brown. Yeah. However, Ms. Brown also served, as, served per se County, New Jersey as an assistant county council and county adjuster, where she made history as the first African American to serve in these positions. Ms. Brown once again made history when she became the first African American in the state of New Jersey to be elected in a position of county clerk at the tender age of 30. She also the first African American to be elected to any, constitu any constitutional office in the history of Passaic County, New Jersey. And I bring to you now a very special, powerful and humble woman who is also the Judge Cameron Brown. She is here with us today presenting Judge Karen Brown. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jamie. Good morning, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and fellow advocates of progress. As we gather here today to celebrate Women's History Month, 
I am deeply honored to stand before you today as a testament to the power of hard work, resilience, and the unwavering belief in one person's ability to affect change. My journey, much like many of yours, has been one of challenges, triumphs, and the relentless pursuit of justice and equality. When I was just 14 years old, the trajectory of my life was forever changed by a series of events that unfolded on a Saturday morning. While I was away at a drama competition, narcotics detectives raided my home. They arrested my mother, my father, and my 13-year-old brother. My father was addicted to crack cocaine and sold drugs to support his habit. It was a moment that shattered my world and left me to return home to an empty house facing weeks without food and the profound absence of my family. Witnessing my family being torn apart, my father and mother led into court in shackles, both dressed in orange jumpsuits emblazoned with the words, Passaic County Jail. My 13-year-old brother locked up in a youth detention center. This left an indelible mark on my young mind. I recall feeling a sense of hopelessness, helplessness, and despair while I was sitting in the back of the courtroom watching my parents get arraigned. This was the very same courtroom where I would eventually sit as a municipal court judge. <laughs> Although my father was one, the one who engaged in the drug activity and was willing to take full responsibility, my mother, who was mentally disabled, pled guilty to a crime that she had no involvement in. My mother did not have the emotional capacity to understand what was taking place, and we could not afford legal representation. We rarely had food in the home, and we barely could keep a roof over our head, given my mother's meager monthly public assistance check. It was a moment of profound realization, a realization that adversity has the power to shape us in ways we could never have imagined. In the midst of that turmoil, I made a solemn vow to myself to become an advocate for those who could not afford legal representation, to stand up for the voiceless, and to fight tirelessly for equality and justice under the law. I wanted to be a beacon of hope for those who, like my family, faced injustice and adversity without the means to defend themselves. That injustice fueled my determination to ensure that no one else would suffer a similar fate due to lack of resources or representation. Throughout my career, I have carried with me the lessons learned during that period of adversity, the importance of empathy, compassion, and the relentless pursuit of justice. From representing public housing tenants and community organizations in my hometown of Patterson, to serving constituents as an elected and appointed official, sitting on the bench as the first African-American chief judge of the Passaic Municipal Court, sitting as a judge in my hometown, as well as in my current position as an assistant general counsel for Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and the co-chair of the legal department's DEI committee. I have dedicated myself to breaking down barriers and empowering others to seek justice. Today, I am reminded every day of the transformative power of perseverance and determination. As we celebrate Women's History Month, let us remember the struggles of those who came before us. The sacrifice made by countless women like Harriet Tubman, Claudette Colvin, Rosa Parks, Fannie Lou Hamer, Madam C.J. Walker, Ruby Bridges, Michelle Obama, Kamala Harris, and my greatest personal inspiration, Shirley Chisholm, who ironically passed away on the day I was sworn in as the first African-American county clerk in the state of New Jersey. Let us not only honor the trailblazers who have come before us, but also reaffirm our commitment to building a more just and equitable society for future generations. Let us honor their legacy by continuing to fight for equality and justice, to stand as beacons of hope for those who need it most, and to strive towards a future where justice prevails, where no one is left behind, and where every individual, regardless of circumstance, has, true, has a true opportunity to thrive and succeed. 
Thank you and keep up the fight. We want to thank the Women's Auxiliary and Judge Brown for the presentation this morning. Right now, the Change Ensemble. When you're lonely and your heart is filled with despair, remember God cares. God cares for you. And you can't find your way out. God will see you through. See you through. See you through. Just call. Just call by the name of Jesus. Just call his name aloud. Oh, I pray so. under the direction of our musical director, Minister Tyrone Richardson. Brothers and sisters, it is indeed our honor and privilege today to have with us for our inspirational words segment, the Reverend Thurcell C. Williams, Executive Pastor, New Hope Baptist Church of East Orange, New Jersey. Let's give her a welcome. Praise the Lord, everybody. 
Amen. It is indeed a pleasure to be back here again. We rise and give honor to God the Father, certainly to God the Son, to the power of the Holy Spirit that is rich and alive in this place. Certainly we give honor, amen, to the Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton. Will you join with me, amen, as we celebrate him? Amen. I bring you greetings from the great state of New Jersey. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. From the New Hope Baptist Church of East Orange. And I also serve as the Interfaith Caucus Chair for the Democratic Convention of New Jersey. Let us go to the word of God for today. Amen. Looking at your Gospels, Mark 5 uh, begins reading in this way. Um, beginning at verse 30 because of the brevity of our time. Mark 5 and 30 begins reading this way, and immediately Jesus, knowing in himself that the virtue had gone out of him, he turned about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked around to see her and who had done this thing, but the woman was fearing, y'all, and yet she was trembling, knowing what was done in her she came and fell down before him and told him all the truth and he said unto her daughter thy faith hath made thee whole go in peace and be healed of thy plague for the time that is ours on today and with my jersey girls having my back amen i want to te- preach to y'all on this morning from the thought i dare you to touch him i dare you to touch him my greatest issue on today with this text is that that Jesus uh, uh, here as we look at this moment of healing is that we often give more credence to the, her issue of blood rather than the intimacy of her brooch. I want to ask on today, have you ever touched God? Uh, a record of healings in the Bible. Jesus uh, uh, healed many people. There was a man with leprosy in Galilee. Peter's mother in Capernaum. Oh God did his numbers in Capernaum y'all. Uh, there was a few people in Nazareth. A man was deaf and could barely walk in Decapolis, a blind man just right outside of Bethsaida, some other blind folk in Jerusalem. In a synagogue, there was a woman who could not stand up straight for 18 years, but none of those, y'all, was a woman with an issue of blood. I, and I know somebody is saying on today, preacher, uh, 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 what is it that was different about this woman? I'm so glad that y'all asked. The difference here is that of all of those women, amen, she was the only one that dared to touch for herself. Uh huh. No request, no announcement, no permission. Just a spirit that was desperate enough, a spirit that was torn enough, a spirit that was weary enough, a spirit that was convinced enough that what she had heard was enough to make her risk it all. And as I look at y'all on today, amen, I wonder if there's anybody in the room that's willing to risk it all for God. I know somebody on today might be saying, but preacher, her issue was not spiritual, but rather it was medical. I beg to differ with y'all on today that if you've dealt with anything for 12 long years somewhere in there prayer has endured if you dealt with anything for 12 long years you had to get a praise to get your way through if you dealt with anything for 12 long years somewhere in there you found yourself on the mourner's bench This sister was now in need of the throne of grace. This sister was indeed in a spiritual situation. And I wish I had all the time, but for the three minutes that left, I'm going to break it down to y'all like this. Amen. That when we decide, amen, that we really desire and dare to touch God, the first thing you got to do is that you've got to forge past systematic failures. Uh Uh-huh. You've got to forge past. I'm still in the text. It says, and a certain woman had her blood issue for 12 long years. Uh, He had healed 14 times before her but never had he dealt with anyone in this way y'all. I wish I had time to tell you all the ways that the system had failed her. I wish that I could tell you how when they saw her come in. I want to imagine that she was black on today. That when they saw her coming in they already decided they were going to give her subpar treatment. I wish that we could talk on today about our sisters who still lead in maternal death in the United States states of America. I wish we had time on today to talk about how black women are the highest rates of cancer death, hypertension death, lupus death in the United States of America. But on today, I only got two minutes and 30 left. I 
I want to make the suggestion on today that if you dare to touch God, you've got to be willing to forge past systematic failures to find the healing that you need. But the second thing is, is that if you dare to trust God, you've got to follow your own voice. Because she said in there, for if I may but touch his garment, I shall be made whole. For she said in the word, if I may touch his garment, then I shall be made whole. I just stopped by Harlem on this beautiful Saturday morning to tell somebody what you say about your situation matters. Uh, what you voice out of your mouth matters. Uh, Proverbs tells us this way that the tongue has the power of life and death uh, and those that love it will eat of its flesh. Uh, beloved, what you say about your situation matters. Uh, and lastly y'all, uh, if you dare to touch God, uh, you gotta find peace in your healing. Uh, the Bible says that after she had got healed uh, and the blood had dried up y'all uh, that she began to tremble when God called her out uh, I want to know just for the minute and 20 seconds that is left uh, is there anybody in Harlem that's been healed uh, is there anybody that's been delivered uh, is there anybody that dared to touch God uh, I heard you earlier no justice uh, no peace uh, I want to know on today uh, if you really trust God y'all then you will find peace uh, with your healing and continue to do the work that God has called you to do. Man, I dare you to trust God. We want to thank Reverend Williams, New Hope Baptist Church, East Arms, New Jersey, for that inspirational word. The Change Choir.
under the direction of our musical director, Tyrone Richardson. Brothers and sisters, get on your feet right now because I'm about to bring to you the president and founder of the National Action Network, the Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton. No justice. No peace. No justice. No peace. No justice. No peace. No justice. No peace. What do we want? Justice. What do we want? Justice. What do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. 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 Fist bump the person next to you. Tell them you love them. celebrate and in many ways enhance our understanding of women during Women's History Month. We should think about women not in the context of right now, but think in the context in which they lived. When I think about outstanding women like Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune, who founded the National Council of Negro Women she founded it in 1935, 20 years before Rosa Parks sat in the front of the bus, 19 years before Brown versus the Board of Education. So when you think of the context of when people did what they did, you realize the greatness of what their contribution was. A lot of us look at people and act like things are old school and that doesn't mean anything because you are judging in your present time what they had to face in their time. That's right. That's right. But Mary McLeod Bethune formed this civil rights group when blacks were not only in the back of the bus, in many areas they couldn't get on the bus. She stood up for black pride when there was no such thing as black pride, she was the direct child of slaves. Yet something in her made her reach for excellence and went on and found colleges and developed educational institutions way before Thurgood Marshall went to the Supreme Court. So at the end of the day, the best you can do in your life and mine is do the best you can in the time you live in. Right. 
Because 30 years from now, they're going to act like what you did didn't mean nothing. But if you operate in the time God gives you to do like Mary McLeod Bethune do, be excellent even when they say you're worthless. Your time will, your change will come. Your change will come. In 1968, there was a man running for president named Richard Nixon running uh, against Hubert Humphrey. And there was a lot of activism going on, and there was a lot of dissension. Martin Luther King had been killed that April. Robert Kennedy had been killed that June. There was riots and violence, and Richard Nixon ran as a law and order candidate. He got one of the major civil rights leaders to come to Brooklyn to run for Congress, named James Farmer, who was a legitimately great civil rights leader. But James Farmer was a Republican and ran on Richard Nixon's ticket. And all of the media just knew that James Farmer was going to walk into that seat given his national notoriety, given that the Nixon folk put a lot of money behind his campaign. But he ran up against a little diminutive black woman in Brooklyn who said that it's not going to be that easy because I'm unbought and I'm unbossed. And I remember Bishop Washington, my pastor now, had liked James Farmer, but I got out there and I kept seeing this woman and I was little, I was 13 years old, I'd be on the megaphone, standing on the corner. That's what Bishop Daughtry always talk about. First I saw me, I had voter registration and, and a little megaphone, like, uh, like, uh, like McHenry and Christian be doing now. I was the original megaphone activist. And Shirley Chisholm said to me, young man, you're on the wrong side. And she recruited me, and I flipped and went with Shirley. At 13, it, it wasn't no real flip, because I was 13, I couldn't vote no how. But she, over the years, would spend time with me. When she ran for president in 72, which was the first year 18-year-olds could vote, though we couldn't vote to the general election, I was a uh, youth director. I thought about Shirley Chisholm on last Sunday when I marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma where they were beaten on that bridge in 65 for getting the right to vote. And I was walking across that bridge with my arm locked in with Kamala Harris, the first black woman to be the vice president of the United States. And I thought about if it hadn't have been for Shirley Chisholm, there wouldn't have been a Kamala Harris. Right. And I was saying in my soul, somewhere Shirley looking down from heaven, seeing that we kept on marching and kept going. She lost a race for president and they were beaten on that bridge, but they didn't give up. Cause champions are not about those that operate in sunshine. Champions are those that operate through the rains and the storms. And somehow Shirley speaks back through the ages to say, if you don't give up, if you don't give out, your change will come. Your change, your change will come. Will come. Your change, your change is gonna come. Don't you give up.
National Action Network Change Choir, give them a big hand. Give them a big hand. Certainly we're happy to be with you another Saturday morning for the Saturday Action Rally for you that are here live in the House of Justice, 106 West 145th Street in the village of Harlem. And for you that are watching us and listening to us on various media outlets, 1190 WLIB AM radio in New York and other outlets around social media, we are happy to be with you another Saturday morning to give our report on where the action is. Give a hand to our presider, Attorney Michael Hardy. Our musical director, Minister Tyrone Richardson. Give a hand to our inspirational preacher, Reverend Williams. Give. And certainly we enjoyed, uh, uh, give a hand to Attorney Brown. I was listening to her, and of course Jamie Bland, who's one of our stalwart women leaders in our own right. Come on, give it for Jamie Bland. And Jamie what, leads one of our strongest chapters, and I know she's getting ready for our convention. And uh, she's a lot of folks do things because they want to be seen. She does things because she wants to see change. And I give her a lot of credit for that. And our Women's Auxiliary, who's carried on this uh, month doing Women's History Month. And certainly to all of our uh, seniors that come I'm not talking about Mother Ivy now. I'm talking about Attorney Hardy. <laughs> Brother Tony, stand up, Tony, so you can be seen. <laughs> if you don't give Tony some recognition, he's going to find a way to be seen. <laughs> you can sit down now, Tony. Let me say uh, by way of announcements that tomorrow morning at uh, 11 o'clock I'll be preaching the 22nd anniversary. Welcome Impact Television watching us all over. I'll be preaching the 22nd anniversary at New Hope Baptist Church for our own uh, Northeast Regional Director who pastors that church. And uh, he is, he and his wife celebrating 22 years pastoring New Hope Baptist Church, Reverend Steffi Bartley. <laughs> and all of you in the Jersey area and you that are not at a church home should meet us at New Hope in the morning. Certainly, I don't know a better activist leader than Reverend Steffi Bartley, 22 years. They have been right there, came behind his father, honoring uh, the legacy of his daddy and pastoring that church. Now, while I say that, and for uh, I would definitely want Tony and them to get this, this daylight savings time move up tonight. So don't show up thinking that you there at 11 and it's 12. Somebody take out Tony's pocket watch that he got when Abe Lincoln was president and turn it up for him. Turn it up now so he'd be all right later. Because a lot of y'all don't understand that the clock moves. Not when you wake up. It's going to move at midnight whether you woke or not. All right. We can have... Movements on many things, but we can't rebel against daylight saving time, at least not by tonight. So we want y'all to watch uh, and to be there and be part of that. 
I also want to say by way of announcements that uh, I'm so proud of our organizers here at NAN, Reverend McHenry and Christian, that that has had every Thursday kept the march and picketing going in front of the offices of uh, one of those that are leading the end diversity, equity, and inclusion, Bill Ackman. And uh, they're on their ninth week, 10th week. And I've only missed three. I, I didn't come this week because I had to go to Queens where we called for a summit on black unemployment, Reverend Patrick Young. And I stood with them. By the time I got through the traffic, y'all were gone. And uh, Bishop Daughtry got tracked up in the traffic, but he was on his way too. We were texting. He, he, he and I, somebody taught Bishop Daughtry how to text, so he texts. <laughs> he texts all day. It don't matter to him. He text. He got that thing down pat. And uh, But I'm so proud of them because movements are about how you can do several things at the same time. So our Las Vegas chapters on those out there that are against DEI and our Atlanta office is on that all at the same time. So when we have our convention April 10th through the 13th, all of them, the, the hotel is about sold out already from people out of town. That's why I keep saying every Saturday to you in the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut area, don't register late and then wonder why there ain't no room for you. Cause folk from out of town are planning now because they only got four or five weeks. So they got a budget, how they gonna fly in and pay the hotel and all that. You right here and you say, well, I ain't got to worry about a hotel. No, but you gonna have to worry about a seat because we are going to let those that register first have the seating first. And I haven't even announced all of the uh, uh, workshops and all of the people that we've invited to come. But we always have the best and the brightest. And it's free. You ain't got no reason not to come. Even if you can't come every day. Come uh, April 10th through the 13th. And you that are listening on radio or watching us on television... You can go right now to www.nationalactionnetwork.net and you can register online. Or you can call 1-877-626-4651. 1-877-626-4651. And one of the things that we do at our convention is we deal with an action agenda across the board and report on what was done the year before. Clearly, we have got to deal with black economics and black economic conditions because what we are seeing in this fight against diversity, equity, and inclusion is a fight that's going to trickle down to the people on the ground in our communities. It's not just about black millionaires with financial services companies and Robert Smith who's a billionaire and all of them and they had a convention every year they'll be there this year doing a workshop it's about who they employ and people affording housing if they close DEI they lay off those that are working and that are making economic options for us they just in in Florida closed in Florida State University, they just closed the whole DEI uh, uh, office. The whole DEI office closed. 13 people fired. Head of the organization or that unit fired. And they were the ones making sure that there is diversity in employment. So when we approach state of New York, city of New York, city of Richmond, Virginia, city of Atlanta, and say, give me your data on how many black city workers you hire, how many are getting opportunities in your private sector companies. In Atlanta, it may be Coca-Cola. In uh, uh, New York, it may be Wall Street, Goldman Sachs, and others. 
with DEI out, they no longer have to give us the data, which means they don't have to hire blacks, which are many of you are on jobs now because you fit into what they had to report. If they don't have to report, you will find yourself gone and don't know why. And they're openly doing this. So when we talk about people voting and standing up, we're not talking about somebody else. We're talking about you. Because the people that you put in office are the ones that decide the rules of employment and the rules and procedures that will give contracts. Most black folks in this country work at small businesses. If small businesses can't get contracts, they can't thrive. If they can't thrive, you can't have a job. So, I mean, sometimes I think we deal with this stuff like it's abstract. That well, This ain't got nothing to do with me. It got everything to do with you. Because wherever you are working, wherever you are getting an income, is connected to the politics that decided that. I told y'all a few weeks ago, I, I, was, I ran into a friend. I was out in Brooklyn doing something. Stephen Marshall always had me out in Brooklyn doing something with somebody. He discovers more causes than anybody I know. And uh, I was out there, ran into a guy that I went to junior high school with. And I remember now, I came up in the uh, 70s into the 80s, late 60s, 69, I became... Uh, Bill Jones and Reverend Daughtry's youth director here, uh, the chapter, I was 13 years old. And I ran into him. He was against us in breadbasket. He said, y'all in the system. I'm for the overthrow of the government. And in those days, you had folk go to school. We had, they had the uh, Mao Zedong Red Book. Am I right? And, and the uh, Kwame Nkrumah Black Book. And if you didn't have a red book and a black book, you wasn't a revolutionary. And I'm running around talking about bread basket. And they talking about Che Guevara. So I said to him, how you doing? He said, man, I'm all right. I said, uh, you, you still waiting on the revolution? Man, leave me alone. <laughs> he said, I don't believe nothing. I watch your TV show, but I'm not in that. Y'all got that, da, 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 da. I was talking just like he talked. 50 years, 55 years ago. And we stood there and talked a long time because I was glad to see him. We were always friends even though we disagreed. And he said, well, let me go and I got to go check the mailbox, see if my social security card can. I said, to do what? He said, to see if my social security check can. I said, I thought you don't believe in the system. I thought you want to overthrow the government. You getting a government check? So you are a government finance revolutionary. <laughs> but you don't believe in voting for who sustains Social Security. You want to reap what others had to plant and grow. That's why when I hear these arguments about whose side you on with Biden or Trump. The issue is not whose side you on, the issue is who's on your side. I judge who I'm gonna vote for by who going in there and vote in my interest. Well, you know, there's a lot wrong with all both and a lot wrong with you. I'm not looking for them to be perfect. Jesus is my savior. That ain't my president or my governor or my mayor. So let's have some common sense. Let me, let me show you the, something that, that, that is interesting about that. You have the white evangelicals that preach against all kinds of things. Preach against Women having the right to choose, preach against gays, preach against drinking and smoking and all of that. They got a list of all the things you don't do. 
yet they supported Donald Trump. Won't y'all get that listening to the barbershop? Everything that they preach against, Donald Trump does openly. But because Donald Trump supports and help put in in his four years what is in their interest, they forget all of what he does because of what he will do for them. And that's the same kind of sense we got to have. Talking about how old is Biden. He looked like he had a lot of energy the other night. Yeah. Biden got up there the other night, spoke over an hour. Shook everybody's hand in the room. He's the last one to leave. They had to cut the lights out to get him out the chamber. Then they get on right-wing television and say, well, they must have gave him some B-12. <laughs> Good, give him some B-12 when he signs a voting rights bill. <laughs> and then Trump is about losing it. I guess y'all saw I was on Morning Joe a couple days this week. We played where Trump get up and speak and just goes, can't even keep up with his own words. He ended two or three sentences just talking blah, 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 blah. <laughs> like Ralph Crandom in the honeymooners. <laughs> y'all y'all got to be a certain age to know what the honeymooners are. <laughs> Tony will stand in the back and they'll tell y'all about the honeymoon. <laughs> Rachel Nordlinger wasn't even born when Jackie Gleason was doing the honeymoon. This is about our interest. Last Sunday, we went down to Selma. Every year, I go to the commemoration of the march across Edmund Pettus Bridge. 1965, they marched across that bridge. And, and I, I had on uh, Sister Toure, Fire Toure, who uh, has the local festival there every year. She from Selma. And I had her on the television show on Politics Nation last Sunday. Uh, that's why I tell you every Saturday Sunday, watch it at 5 p.m. Eastern, MSNBC, because you never knew I'm going to have on. I had the chairman of the Black Caucus, and I had all of the senators and Congress people. Well, I have them, some of them on tonight and tomorrow, but I wanted her on to tell the story, because people don't understand the history. And history is best told by those that were there. She said the context of the march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge was that in a neighboring town called Marion, Alabama, there was the drive to get the registered, to get blacks to be able to vote. 64, they got the Civil Rights Act, but they didn't have the protection to have their voting rights. So in 65, they were having these, these rallies around Alabama and other places in the state around voting rights. Reverend James Orange was having the rally. The Klan and the local police, who in some ways were the same thing, came and raided the rally. They ran out the church, and one young man got killed by the local white shot him named Jimmy Lee Jackson. Jimmy Lee Jackson got killed, which outraged everybody. And rather than them being coward, they said, now we need to march from our city to Montgomery to get justice for Jimmy Lee Jackson. Why march to Montgomery? That's the state capital then, the state capital now. And they wanted to go and bring the case of Jimmy Lee Jackson and voting to the governor of Alabama. Now, let me just pause there for a minute. A lot of folk that are young and don't understand, not necessarily young by age, but young in their activism, Rachel, 
don't understand when they say, well, Nash Action Network and Shopton and Daughtry and them, they exploit tragedies. No, tragedies were always the impetus of organizing around a bigger issue. There wouldn't have been no march from Selma to Montgomery if it had not been the tragedy of killing Jimmy Lee Jackson. Y'all with me? There wouldn't have been, it was always, Scottsboro boys generated a movement. Emmett Till generated a movement. Rosa Parks said when she sat on the back, on the front of the bus in 55, it was because of she was thinking about Emmett Till. So if we take a tragedy like Trayvon Martin, or like Eric Gardner, whose mother's here every week, who's sitting behind, I'm standing. If we take a tragedy, that is what is done historically. So when people be saying that, they be, in their mind, talking about how hard they got us. And in my mind, I be saying they are telling us they're ignorant of history. The Selma March started. Because they killed Jimmy Lee Jackson at a voting rally. They said, well, let's not go from Marion. Let's go from Selma, which was a neighboring city. There was a lady that lived in Selma, who I knew till she passed. She lived ripe old age. And she hosted them, Amelia Boynton. Many of you might have remembered when I marched across that bridge with Barack Obama, when he was president, we had a wheelchair that we were wheeling. That was Amelia Boykin. Commander Harris and I had another one of them on a wheelchair last week because some of them are still alive and are in wheelchairs. They went to Selma and decided to organize from Selma to walk 10 days to Montgomery, about 10 miles a day. Some of y'all, a few years ago, we redid the march, took 10 days. Me and uh, Ashley talked about it. Uh, my daughter Ashley uh, went with me on last Sunday, and she remembered as we were riding from Montgomery, we landed in Montgomery and drove to uh, uh, Selma, and the, and the TV crew and all of them with us. And she remembered different places on the road that they stopped marching because we did, redid the march. So the idea was they were going to march and generate publicity around what Jimmy Lee Jackson had done and they wanted voting rights. There was a debate then among those on what strategy we wanted. You had SCLC, which was Dr. King's organization, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. That's where I come out. I was youth director under them here in, in Brooklyn. Southern Christian Leadership Conference. It was always up front. We was black church based, which is what NAND is, black church based. Then you had the NAACP and you had SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which were the younger college students. John Lewis was the head of that. The argument was the SNCC guy said, Dr. King get all the publicity. We ain't marching with him. Blah, 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 blah. Like some folks say now. You know, the, 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 the catch-22, they'll say if Daughtry show up, he's going to take all the attention. If Sharp and Sharp, they're going to take all the publicity. Then if we don't come, they didn't come, that's why the press didn't come. <laughs> you get it either way. It's a catch-22. Right. Oh, if we wasn't big enough for you to come. Uh-huh, if we was on TV, you'd come. If I do come, I'm only reading the TV here because of you. So they were arguing and debating. Finally, the resolve was Dr. King wasn't going to come the first day. He was going to preach at his home church that he co-pastored with his father. And Hosea Williams, who was his field director, was going to represent Dr. King at the march. John Lewis and Hosea would march and lead the column across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma and start the first day on the way to Montgomery. Miss Boynton was there, all of them there. They had a file of about 200 
two by two going across that bridge. As they got to the top of the bridge where we stopped last Sunday to have the prayer that I led with Kamala Harris, that's when the troopers said, don't go no further. And they said, we had the right to march. They said, don't go any further. And without warning, they took tear gas out and started beating them on the bridge. The television stations, news cameras was there and filmed the beating. And that night, the beating went all over the world. It's before social media. This was CBS, NBC, CBS. And people around the world said they're beating folks in America over the right to vote. That is what led Lyndon Johnson and them to deal with a Voting Rights Act. It was organizing around Jimmy Lee Jackson into the brutality of the Selma March that led to the Voting Rights Act. Now, they put the Voting Rights in. The Voting Rights Act didn't give us the right to vote. Some folks be saying, well, why do we have to have a Voting Rights Act renewed every five years to give us the right to vote? Voting Rights Act didn't give us the right to vote. Voting Rights Act protected our right to vote. They set up where you could not change the districts it, that had been changed historically to try and, in many ways, circumvent our power. You could not make any changes in those districts, in the South and in two congressional districts in New York. So the Voting Rights Act was to protect our voting rights. Five times. They renewed the Voting Rights Act, even while Reagan was president. So many times the people forget, well, what did they do since Dr. King? Many things we did was to protect what King did. Yeah. People don't understand it took every effort we could to just keep affirmative action and keep voting rights and keep open housing and keep the fight around police brutality. Same time, your, sometime your job is to maintain and then move on. While we were trying to maintain, the opposition started organizing to withdraw what had been established by our fathers and our mothers. So just like people like me grew up in the movement, there were people growing up on the other side saying we got to stop voting rights and stop affirmative action. And what they did was they captured and looked and took our strategy and worked it against us. How did they do that, Reverend? They took the flag and the Bible and they convinced white America that this was the righteous thing to do. We abandoned our church. Start saying, oh, they just old school. Oh, this, they, 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 they too soft. And gave them the moral ground. And they used that to beat us back into killing affirmative action. And killing right to vote. And stopping police brutality. What I'm trying to tell you is that if you study history, history is about continuity. It is not about confusion. And there are those that are assigned to confuse us rather than continue us. I was reading uh, uh, Paul. Paul had to have Timothy and Titus. It's an extension. That's why when I meet folk, I'm an activist. Great. I believe in justice, fine. Are you a part of a group? No. Or have you started a group? No. Well, who can I talk to that know you? Me. 
if you are not attached to anything, then what is the basis of your activism? I, I preached this week for the workers, uh, in, uh, workers meeting for the jurisdiction of the Church of God in Christ in eastern uh, Long Island. Bishop Frank White is the bishop. He asked me to come. I was honored to do it because I grew up in the Church of God in Christ under Bishop Washington. And the thing that I most admire, among other things, about Bishop White is if you go in his office, all laced on the walls are the history and the bishops and the people that have come through that church telling the history of the church. Because he is connected to what he comes from. Anybody that is long-lasting is connected to something bigger than them. We don't have flashes in the pans, but they don't last. The things that last is things that are connected because the strength of a tree is its roots, not its branches. And too many of us are impressed with leaves. Leaves go by seasons. Roots stand no matter what the season is. Some of y'all got seasonal friends. They, they are right with you as long as things are good. They're summertime friends. But you catch some problems. You go broke. You go to the club and you can't pick up the tab. Then you find out who your friends are. Those that talk to you start talking about you. Hello. These movements are connected. There's a reason why some of us lasted for decades and others didn't last to the end of the summer. I talk about my friend as a revolutionary. I could count much more than him. That every time something happened, they out there leading the charge. A march they didn't call, by the way. We'll call the march. They'll show up and going to lead our march talking about what they ain't going to take no more. I saw later the other day, 10 years ago, marching with us with Eric Gardner. I ain't taking it no more. Well, you done took a whole lot more in 10 years and we ain't seen you. Because this is not about a fit, it's about a movement. Because the other side, those that oppose our rights, those that oppose our rising up, they never stopped. I told y'all the other week, they went, first organized the birthers, then the Tea Party. Went from the Tea Party to something else, then ended up with Donald Trump all in 20 years and they took the White House with somebody that, that didn't behave and act like any way that they believe but what did he do he appointed 200 federal judges put three people on the Supreme Court what did the three do they hooked up to the two conservatives there and in a year they ended women's right to choose Ended affirmative action, canceled student debt loan forgiveness in a year. But that movement started 30 years ago. And they built and they built and they took over local school boards and local community boards and local cities all the way to the White House. And you don't want to be a part of nothing until somebody gets you mad. And it is in your anger, like Jimmy Lee Jackson, some of us try to organize your anger for long-term change. Because folk don't care that you mad, they care when you want to make change. You having a fit, they give you, when you a baby, you learn that. You start kicking and screaming, they give you a pacifier. It ain't even no milk, just a pacifier. And they give you social pacifiers. And you 
take the pacifier. As soon as you quiet down, they move on with their agenda. That is why we have a National Action Network. That is why we try to put things in place. That's why we have our convention. 33 years later, after we started the National Action Network, we're on the precipice of a member of this organization becoming the first black speaker of the House of Representatives, Hakeem Jeffries. 33 years later, one of the founding members of the organization is the mayor of New York, Eric Adams, come out of Bishop Daughtry's church. We never stop and never will. And I'd rather be part of something to make a movement than to be part of something that just gets mad when something happens. That just jumps up in the middle of their emotions rather than organize on a methodical long-term agenda. Yeah. Bring you right back into this whole case of this election. They tried to cut off, you know, you got our bang bang revolutionary folk that talk about, I don't believe in voting. Like they gonna not have the election cause you don't believe in it. <laughs> Let me tell y'all the secret, they gonna have the election whether you show up or not. And whoever get elected gonna make decisions you gonna live by. Cause you living by them. Ain't got nothing to do with me. Got everything to do with you. Where your house is is where somebody zoned that houses could be there. Where your business is is, is where somebody zoned the mall could be there. When you stop of the red light on this corner, somebody decided that there's a traffic stop light on that corner rather than the corner before you. All of that is decided by politics. But what they are depending on is you being too ignorant to vote on who's going to make those decisions. They count on you to count yourself out. And that's why when folks like us stand up, they try to give all kind of motives to us. Well, they just want publicity. They just want that. Oh, them preachers selling out. Selling out to who? For what? You know, it's a new, new thing. Well, it's an old thing. Anything, anybody disagree, you sell out. No, they just disagree with you. Anybody got to pay nobody to disagree with your ignorance? We do that for free. Because what you're saying don't make sense. A guy called me the other day, Red Mal. I, I went to your office in Atlanta and I needed some help and I didn't get no help. First of all, if we try to help you, we don't owe you because we are not responsible. He had, got, had a criminal justice problem. We didn't put you in jail. We're trying to help you clear yourself. Now, you got the wrong person, because Reverend Sailor had our office down there. He, you know, prayed five times a day. I pray, but maybe I missed two or three. So Sailor tried to be nice to you. I'm getting ready to tell you don't come back, because I'm not responsible for your condition. I'm trying to help your condition. You get mad at the wrong folk. Folk try to help you, you get mad at. Hello? You got so much to say about folk fighting for freedom, but nothing to say about folks that are trying to keep you down. You know better than to have an attitude with them. Well, I tell you what, uh, I told the brother, I said, well, I tell you what, I'll be in Atlanta a couple weeks, why don't you come to me? Well, you know, I got to go to my job. Oh, you ain't mad at your boss, but you mad at us trying to help you. I tell you what, don't bother with it no more. We be whatever you want to call. No, Reverend, don't be like that. No, I'm going to be like that. You was better off talking to folk at the Atlanta office. We must be organized and be sober-minded if we're going to fight because these people are serious. 
if you got a man with 91 felony count indictments and four cases, they had to come up with $91 million yesterday on the smallest case and got to come up with over 400 million by the end of the month with all of that sordid history and they want to make him the president of the United States again, you are in as serious and precarious a times that you ever read about. This is unthinkable in American history that you'd have a thug like this about to go back to the White House. And the only reason they want to put him back is so he can put you back in your place. And if you don't have enough sense to see that, then you deserve to go back there. Somebody got to beg you to help yourself. They ain't doing it subtle. They open about it. Women has no rights. Had the woman that did the rebuttal to President Biden the other night sitting in her kitchen. Because that's showing you that's where they want to put women. Put your apron on, get back in the kitchen, have a bunch of babies when we tell you and shut up. When I asked them she in the kitchen, they sending that signal. They're going back to Aunt B in the Goma Powell days. And if women let them do it, it's your fault. Some of us are not going back. Some of us are not going to be distracted. Some of us are not going to let them take our mothers and fathers bled and died to give us these rights. That's what I was thinking about. Marching across that bridge at Selma last Sunday. We paid a price for this. We earned this. And we're not going to let you take it back. We, as we talk, on the national stage. We earned the right to be there. Well, you know what? Y'all ought to handle your business down there in Harlem, Rev. No, I talk about everything everywhere. My great-grandfather, great-grandmother built this country. We made Cotton King. We used Tobacco Road. We made you the richest country in the world. I come to collect on the debt you owe us. asking for no favor we built this you didn't figure this out all by yourself you worked us brutalized us but you never thought they'd have children and their children would have children and those children's children is competing with your children because they fought to give us the right that's why I'm not scratching where I don't itch I'm not laughing at what ain't funny. This is serious business. And then that's why NAN has been a church-based organization. You can be whatever religion you want. But we believe in faith. Why? Because if you believe in a higher power, then you will not bow to the powers of this world. What gave Moses, what gave Daniel, what gave Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what gave all of those in the Bible the power to stand up to the Nebuchadnezzars and the Belshazzars and the Pharaohs was they believed that the God they served was stronger than Pharaoh and stronger than Nebuchadnezzar and stronger than Belshazzar. And that's why I'm not scared of no Donald Trump because the God I serve is stronger than Donald Trump. Yeah. 
Well, Mal, you better be careful. They'll go come after you. And I'm coming after them. Yeah. They done been after me before. They stabbed me, indicted me, done everything they can. They did everything but kill me. But the God I serve will take the knife wounds out your chest. The God I serve will turn juries around in the courtroom. The God I serve or make the front page turn around and praise you. I'm not talking about what I heard. I'm talking about what he done for me. They used to sing in church, you don't know like I know what he done for me. I read about what he did for Frederick Douglass. I read about Booker T. Washington. But I know the story of Al Sharpton. I know what he done for me. He picked me up. He turned me around. He turned my midnights into day. Oh yeah, you can turn on Politics Nation or, or Morning Joint see me in my glory. But you don't know my story. I go down 444 Hopkinson Avenue, Brownsville, multi-service center. We used to have to work there and go around the corner and sneak to get mama's welfare check and food stamps. So when you see me downtown or you see me with one of our backers give us a private plane to go to Selma or go somewhere, I don't apologize for that. Because I think about where God brought me from. Where folks say I wouldn't be nothing and couldn't go nowhere. But God had something for you. If you quit listening to what folk tell you, God got another spot for you. And if you just believe in what God got for you, he may not be there when you want him. But mama say he always on time. If you hold on, you about to give out right before your change come. Don't give up. Don't give out. Because in God's own time, he's got a way out of no way. Don't you step back. Don't you let them talk you down. Because God got a plan. Many of us talk about, I don't know how long we going to fight. I don't either. But I know we going to keep fighting. It seemed like it, it's one step forward and one backward. I know that too, but we're going to keep fighting. Because I've seen too much to turn back now. We come too far. Turn back now. When Daughtry and them started, they never thought they'd see a black president. But they not only was there, his daughter worked for Barack Obama. Never thought when I was running with Shirley Chisholm, I'd see a black woman sitting in the vice president's house. But Kamala Harris is there. I've seen too many breakthroughs yeah. to give up now. Yeah. So my faith is built on nothing less. Jesus' blood and righteousness. I know that if you hold out, sometimes God will allow things to happen to test us. Sometimes we get so contrary yeah. that God got to slap us back in line. Yeah. That's what happened in the Bible with the children of Israel. Yeah. McHenry, they forgot the God that brought them across, so God let them wander 40 years in the desert, 40 years in the wilderness, because they forgot who brought them out of bondage. So 40 years, two generations, and some of us, some of us been wandering. But when God gets ready, just like he opened up the Red Sea for Dr. King's generation, he going to open up the Jordan for our generation. Don't you stop believing. Stand up, black man. Stand up, black woman. This is our day. This is our time. It's time to take attendance for those that believe in the God of our salvation. I know. He didn't bring us this far to leave us now. So I come to tell you, my report is I don't feel no ways tired. 
I come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me. Nobody told me that the road would be easy. I don't believe he brought me this far. I don't believe he brought me this far. I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. I don't feel no Everybody's singing. Everybody's singing. Everybody's singing. Everybody's singing. Sing it like you mean it. Sing it like you mean it. want justice we want freedom everybody's singing everybody's singing everybody's singing everybody's singing I'm opening the doors of the movement. There may be somebody here today in the auditorium that never joined National Action Network. You hear us on radio. You see our activities on television. But you never joined the National Action Network. If you're here today and not a member, all you have to do is come down either aisle and come right to me and we'll sign you up this morning and make you a member. If you're listening on radio or watching us on television, you can go to www.nationalactionnetwork.com.
actionnetwork.net and join right online. But if you're here, come on to me and become a member. Come on. Everybody's singing. Come on. Everybody's singing. Everybody's singing. Everybody's singing. Sing it like you mean it. Sing it like you mean it. Everybody singing. Everybody sing. Everybody singing. One more time, y'all. One more time, y'all. One more time, y'all. Everybody singing. Everybody sing. Everybody singing. One last time, y'all. One last time, y'all. Everybody singing. All right. You and Radio Land, as we go off, go to www.nationalactionnetwork.net. If you've not signed up for our convention April 10th through the 13th, you can sign up online. If you're not a member, you can join online at www.nationalactionnetwork.net. If you, I'm getting ready to take the offering here in the House of Justice. If you want to donate virally, you can do it right there at www.nationalactionnetwork.net. All of you online friends, last week we had thousands tuned in live. You should be a part of the movement, be a member, be a donor, and be ready to be at our convention. We appreciate all of you watching and listening, but be involved and be a part of this movement. All right, let's get ready in the house to take our offering. Let's get ready to take our offering I need.